must expand. A no-growth capitalism, as some of the more naive, some of our more naive ecologists have argued for, is a contradiction in terms. The reason you invest is to accumulate, and your accumulation of capital has no purpose or meaning unless you can mix it with labor to yet increase your wealth further. And of course, you use large sums of it for personal consumption and for political power and for control of your culture and for that wonderful, good, happy life that you so like. As George Bush's wife said, we are millionaires. We are not ashamed of it. We enjoy our wealth. And I thought at last they say it. Finally, they say, instead of, instead of the usual thing is, you know, how we rich suffer and we're misjudged and it's just terrible being rich. Now that nature of expansion really affects the nature of, I mean, it's an important imperative because it means capitalism also can never stay home. It goes abroad. If you ever saw the film Controlling Interest, there's a corporate president who says, those corporations that stayed regional in New England years ago and decided not to go national, we can't even remember their names. They died. We had to go national. And those of us who are now national know we have to go international. We have to invest abroad. So one of the laws of capitalist motion and development is this inexorable expansion. And that means expansion into the expropriation of the third world. A process that's been going on for about 400 years. Perpetrated by the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Dutch, the Belgians, the French, the English. And most recently, most successfully most impressively by the Americans, that is, the American, that is, by the ruling class of these countries, not by the ordinary people. The ordinary people simply paid the costs of empire. The ordinary people simply sent their sons off to die on the plains of India or the jungles of the Congo or in Latin America, wherever else. But that expropriation of the third world has been going on for 400 years, brings us to another revelation that the third world is not poor. You don't go to poor countries to make money. There are very few poor countries in this world. Most countries are rich. The Philippines are rich. Brazil is rich. Mexico is rich. Chile is rich. Only the people are poor. But there's billions to be made there, to be carved out, to be taken. There's been billions for 400 years. The capitalist European American powers have carved out and taken the timber, the flax, the hemp, the cocoa, the rum, the tin, the copper, the iron, the rubber, the bauxite, the slaves, and the cheap labor. They've taken out of these countries. These countries are not underdeveloped. They're overexploited. One of the countries that had a great deal of Western capital in it was Tsarist Russia, mostly English, French, some German, some American, including one Herbert Hoover, who, with Leslie Urquhart, a famous British millionaire, owned the Russo-Asiatic Corporation, which, if the Russian Revolution hadn't happened, Herbert Hoover would be one of the richest men in the world. And years later, when he was president of the United States in 1931, when one-third of this country was unemployed, when people didn't have enough to eat, when people were driven to the edge of desperation. President Herbert Hoover said to the San Francisco Examiner, he said, my greatest ambition in life is to see the overthrow of Bolshevism in Russia. There came with the Russian Revolution a break in the fabric of international capitalist history. There now was a country where the unwashed, where the workers of Petrograd and Moscow were actually taking over, where they were actually taking over the land and the labor and the technology and the resources of their country, where communists were coming into power. And there's a remarkable correspondence between Secretary of State Lansing and President Woodrow Wilson in which Lansing says, the Bolsheviks are wanting in political virtue. They would preach to the ordinary man that he might elevate himself through political means rather than by dint of hard work. That would be a most unfortunate example to the common man in our country and other countries. They understood what was the threat. The Americans themselves, the American ruling class, had very little capital. Didn't have all that much. I tell you about Hoover and a few other speculators, other people like that. But they joined in with 14 other nations to invade the Soviet Union to overthrow the socialist government that had been put in after the Tsar was 
overthrown. The process of invading a revolutionary country is still happening before our eyes. If you want to understand those years after the Russian Revolution, just look at what's happening on going on in Nicaragua. Invasion, either by directly with troops from your own country, or by using surrogate troops. And they use the white armies and the white generals, the white guard armies, embargoes, isolation, withholding food supplies, sabotage, encirclement, refusing diplomatic recognition. These are, the, these are the methods that are used, and these are the methods, the time-honored methods, that are being used right now by Reagan against other another revolutionary government, which is Nicaragua. That process of encirclement and destabilization continued right until World War II. On the eve of World War II, foreign minister of the Soviet Union named Litvinov went to the Western powers and called for an alliance with England, the United States, and France against Nazi Germany, and that if the Germans attacked Czechoslovakia, they would all join in, or attacked Poland, or attacked anybody, that all the powers would join in to fight Hitler and contain him. The Western allies refused those overtures from the Soviet Union, not because they were appeasers, not because they were simple and naive, quite the contrary, because they had a plan of their own, and that plan was Munich, and that plan was, we give Hitler Czechoslovakia, and he goes east, and they were waiting for war, and that war was supposed to come, and it was going to be Nazi Germany finishing off Bolshevik Russia, just as they had sent armies in against Russia just a few years, less than a decade before. So they now plan to do the same, and so they've done again and again. And that war was fought, and most of it was fought on the Eastern Front. Seven out of every ten German soldiers who died in that war died on the Eastern Front. The scale of the fighting was enormous. The Battle of Kursk, Stalingrad, the Battle of Berlin. There's nothing like that happened in the Western Theater, in the Western Front. In the Battle of Berlin, you saw two million German soldiers against three and a half million attacking Soviet soldiers were stupendous. But at the end of that war, the Soviet Union emerged as a major power, very weakened, very much weakened, having lost most of its industries west of the Ural, having lost 20 million people. Most of its transportation, by the way, at the time, was still by horse or oxen in most areas for most of its population, but it still had the Red Army. And yet it was not an army that had any intention marching through Europe, although that was a NATO myth that was cultivated at the time. There's an interesting set of documents that just came out in the American Historical Review, which point out now that the West and the State Department never really believed that the Soviets were going to invade Western Europe. That was a myth which they consciously propagated. They knew that after an exhausting war, the last thing the Russian people would ever go for or the last thing the Russian leaders themselves would ever go for was another war. There was no sense they had no interest in such a war. The war they fought against Germany was defensive, and they wanted to rebuild their country. That was a myth that was consciously propagated, that if we don't stop them, if we don't do NATO, if we don't double, triple, quadruple our defense forces, the Ruskies will be marching under the, under the Arc de Triomphe. said so far is just to point out to you that the Cold War did not begin in 1947, but it began in 1917. That the Cold War has been going on even before the Russian Revolution, in the sense that the U.S. has been consciously, and other Western countries have been consciously suppressing any kind of revolutionary forces. When Ronald Reagan says we've got to stop the Sandinistas and overthrow them because they are an extension of Soviet power, we might ask ourselves, We've been in Nicaragua 11 times, and at least five of those times there was no Soviet Union. We invaded Costa Rica, we invaded Haiti, we invaded Mexico, and there wasn't a Soviet Union. We invaded these countries long before there was a Soviet Union. It's not that they're surrogates of the USSR, but that they're developing revolutionary movements which will bring a competing social order, one that will use the land, the labor, the resources, social needs communally for non-profit public sector development rather than for private capital accumulation. The 
this would mean the death of capitalism, of that class with its power and privileges, with life as they love it and hold it and will fight tooth and nail to defend it. As Miss Bush said, we enjoy our wealth. The U.S. Empire at the end of World War II replaced Britain. The Brits were eased out of Iran. British oil companies were replaced by American oil companies. British sugar companies in Honduras were eased out by American sugar companies, and America also picked up the tab. America built a bases, an American empire, over 2,000 bases around the world, including about 300 major ones. American fleets are in every ocean. American planes fly the skies over every continent, almost. And so we see enormous investment in the third world. And with that enormous investment since World War II, an enormous growth in poverty. Now that's unusual, and that really goes against the accepted ideology, which is that attractive investments in here because that brings prosperity and jobs, all that sort of thing. But what investment has brought to Haiti is the immiseration of the small Haitian farmer. What investment has brought in Latin America and most other countries has been the displacement of the press peasantry, their proletarianization. They're being thrown into shanty towns to suffer poverty wages or chronic underemployment. What investment has brought with it also is increasing illiteracy, sickness, disease, poverty, and a dislocation and disenfranchisement, a growing foreign debt, an indebtedness, growing investment for cash crops. By the way, that's the whole Mexican Revolution was about. Was the land going to belong to the Mexicans so they could grow beans and alfalfa and feed their people? Or was the land going to be belong to the big sugar companies and latifundia owners so they could grow sugar to export as a cro cash crop to make more money, to make more money or coffee or whatever else? And when that growth, when that investment comes into location in the structure of the third world country so that the whole infrastructure gets built around capitalist extraction capital extraction the economist ray brown when he went to cuba before the revolution it was in 1958 he was there about a year or so before was impressed by how every major road he saw went from a sugar plantation to a refinery to a seaport while there were whole communities without roads, they couldn't get to doctors, they couldn't have schools, couldn't see a priest, the sugar companies had their roads. And when you send foreign aid to these countries, nine out of ten of those dollars go to build the infrastructure to subsidize the capital investment of the private corporations, or to pay for the police and the army of that country, not to defend it from foreign invasion, because Iroquois is not going to invade Bolivia, because Taiwan is not going to be invaded by the Philippines, but they need those big armies to defend their rulers from their own people, because those people are in such a state of immiseration. So that's where our foreign aid goes, and as someone once said, foreign aid is when the poor people, that's us, of a rich country, give money to the rich people of a poor country. And when Kenneth Boling gets up, and he says, as you've seen what, you can see what. You can see when you get Britain people like Kenneth Boulding speaking so naively. You can see the troubles you get into, the swamps you go into, the baby talk, silliness you get into when you think without marks, when you think without class analysis. And Kenneth Boulding says, one of the America's leading economists, he says, empire is irrational because it costs more than what we get out of it. The British, it costed them more in India than what they got out of it. The American investment in the Philippines is only about three and a half billion dollars, but we had to give them about six billion dollars in aid. It costs us more than we get out of it. And that's when you think without class analysis, because as we know, as you're going to know before the evening's over, that it's very profitable, because the people who have, been, have the three billion dollar investment aren't the same ones as the people six billion. As Thorstein Veblen said back in 1909, and Boulding should have read him even if he is a Marxist, as Veblen said, the wealth that is extracted from imperialism goes into the coffers of the 
all 
all student organizations, students were very powerful. The first democratically elected governor, president of Guatemala, Arbenz legalized trade unions, opposed newspapers, and then he started doing some very dangerous things. He began to nationalize the onions land of United Fruit Company, and that's when U.S. corporations and the CIA went in to overthrow Arbenz. And that's a matter of public record, by the way. The CIA, the Eisenhower administration, admits that. Eisenhower probably boasted about the CIA overthrew Arbenz because he was a serious leftist influence. And so with Mossadegh in Iran, so with Goulart in Brazil, so with Bosch in the Dominican Republic, so with a variety of other democratic leaders, at least six or seven in Latin America who were overthrown and generals brought in with the aid and assistance of the U.S. government. So it can't be that we're there to foster democracy. We seem to also make war against democracies, and in addition, we support some of the worst dictators. If Reagan is really against tyranny, if he really hates tyranny, why does he send freedom fight? Why doesn't he send freedom fighters into Paraguay or Chile or South Africa? Why doesn't he start sabotaging there, putting a squeeze on them? In fact, the whole fight with Libya might be less of a mystery if you understand that really the worst thing about Colonel Gaddafi, who is kind of a strange guy in some ways, but not as strange as the media has made him out. He has called, you know, and you don't know this, most of you who laughed, he has called repeatedly for negotiations between him and Reagan, for peaceful negotiations, for peaceful settlement of all disputes, and the Reagan administration has repeatedly rebuffed those overtures. That isn't put in the press. I'm not blaming you for not knowing it. You're not going to read it in the rag that I saw out there, the Colorado thing that said terrorist targets hit in Libya. He has done that, and he has done some other things which make him really dangerous. It's not the terrorism. It's not the attack on, on the Vienna and Berlin airports, for which they have no proof that Libya was involved, or which they have proof that the terrorists came out of Syria. The trouble troubles and thing about Gaddafi is that when he took over in 1969, he took over a country that was like Saudi Arabia, a country of mass misery, a lot of rich oil that went into the pockets of a very few rich, and when this colonel's revolution took over, they got rid of the rich, they took all the extra houses and gave them to the poor, they put out a land reform program, they put out a public free school program, they started a national health medical program. Something that we Americans still don't have. The Libyans have it. He planted 40 million trees and started massive irrigation and ecological reclamation. These are some of the things Gaddafi did. And that's a dangerous example to the Arab world. He took a bigger chunk of oil revenues and reinvested them into the needs of his own people. And the per capita earnings of the Libyan people are the highest in the Arab world, the highest in the third world. And you didn't hear that in the media, did you? You didn't hear that on Dan Rather's tonight. That's what, what's dangerous about Gaddafi. And the cue comes. And you know the cue when Reagan says Gaddafi is a tyrant over his own people. Like the Sandinistas are tyrants over their people. Like Allende was a tyrant over the Chilean people. The minute they start social reform, the minute they start tampering with our oil, our bananas, our sugar, our copper, our iron, our bauxite. Why? They're tyrants. The second myth that's given to us is that these revolutionary governments are hostile to us, and that's why we oppose them. Right-wing dictatorship get along with us. They're friendly to us. Why is that, though? What is it about right-wing dictatorships that make them so friendly? Why are they being so friendly about? What is the community of interest that they have? I already explained it, I believe. It's a common class interest, and the left-wing guys come in, but they're hostile to well, that doesn't really seem to be true. The first thing these left-wing governments do when they come into power is ask for friendly diplomatic and economic relations with the U.S. Certainly, that's what the Sandinistas did. They honored the debt that, that the swindler Somoza ran up, and they, and they asked for closer economic relations. That's what the Cubans want. Every socialist country, from a huge power like the Soviet Union to 
a small power like Vietnam or Cuba to a micro micro power like Grenada under the new jewel movement. Every single one of them asked for more trade, normal policies, uh, normal political, economic, and diplomatic relations with the United States, not necessarily out of love, but because they saw it in their self-interest, because their interest was to develop their own economies and to have peace and security in their, on their borders, to invest less in military defense. There is even an article on that in the New York Times in which Fidel Castro makes that point. We want to spend less on our military defense. That doesn't make sense to the Cubans. Why must they go 16,000 miles away to Japan to buy school buses? That's where the Cubans get them. They got 16, they go 16,000 miles away when we could buy them right from Florida, 90 miles away. Why must they get their medical supplies from China and Czechoslovakia when they could get them from the U.S.? Cuba has the largest import tonnage cost of any country in the world because of the U.S. blockade boycott. So it's very much in their interest to cultivate friendlier relations. There's a subset of things there much firmer than love. No one's claiming they love us, and love, after all, you know, is a volatile emotion. It comes and goes. Much firmer than love is self-interest, and therefore the basis of some kind of normal relations with those countries. No, my friends, it's really the Reagan administration that runs the, the, with terror whenever there's the first sign of friendliness from the socialist or revolutionary countries. Reagan, as Tom Wicker said, in regards to the Soviet Union, for instance, in armaments, quote, Reagan will not take yes for an answer. The final reason given is that we must contain the red tide. You hear that March speech by Ronald Reagan, vintage stuff, where he talks about a red tide lapping our border if we allowed Nicaragua to sustain any kind of government that its people have chosen in free and open elections. If we allow that, our own security is at risk. And you can see that superpower, 60,000 man army of the Sandinese us, cutting a swath up through Guatemala, Mexico, Texas, right up here into the heartland, right into Boulder, Colorado, dancing with your daughter and your sister. Do we want that? I hear they're good dancers. The image of that, the image of that tiny nation of three million being a threat to us, you know, reminds me of the Vietnam War. We used to hear the same stuff. We said, if we don't fight them in the jungles of Vietnam, we'll have to fight them on the shores of California. And Walter said, the image of the Vietnamese getting into their little PT boats and coming across the Pacific and taking California is an insult to the U.S. Navy. It's very hard to convince the American people that they should send their sons and maybe, who knows, someday even their daughters to go fight and die in some jungle to make the world safe for the United Fruit Company or Chase Manhattan or Procter and Procter and Gamble or ITT. So you say it's to stop the threat of the communist country. It's very hard to convince the American people that a tiny country like Nicaragua or Vietnam or El Salvador is a threat to U.S. security. So you say it's not Nicaragua. They're the puppets of the Cubans, who are the puppets of Bum Bum Bum, the big red bear and the Kremlin. And yet again, as I just said, these countries continually want friendly overtures, including, including the Soviet. Continually. Soviet Union. What we hear also is that there's another pernicious element, and that the thing we have tried to stop in these countries is, is a thing called communism, and that there are communists in these countries. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it's time we ask, what's a communist? What does a communist do that is so dangerous? They would have us believe that communists merely hunger for power rather than wanting to power to end hunger. They would have us believe well, the New York Times, let me refer to an editorial where they describe the undesirable and offensive Managua regime. By the way, these countries don't have governments, they have regimes, as you'll see in newspapers all the time. We have governments, and I said to myself, what is undesirable and offensive about Managua? Is it the land reform program where they took all that massive land owned by those few rich compradors and gave it out to the people? starved for land? Is it the farm co-ops they've been they're setting up? Is it the community industries and the public work programs that create jobs for people who have been chronically unemployed? Is it the food program, a ration of beans and rice?
advice for every kid in Nicaragua is that nobody, no matter how poor the country is, they're all getting fed, isn't having the lowest infant mortality rate in Central America, despite earthquake and civil war and foreign invasion and attack and embargo, lower even than Costa Rica, which is supposed to be the big show place. What's so offensive about Managua? It is those things in some degree. It is creating a competing social order. It is people. It is those who have been downtrodden. It has been those who have been used as fodder in the capital accumulation process, now claiming back the process of production, claiming back their own land, claiming back their own slag, their own dignity, and saying, this country is going to be for us and not for you anymore, gringo. And that's the communist program. That's what communists are. I had somebody up in Vermont say she got up, and she was one of those trust funders who works on peace a lot, and she said, oh, sorry there, she said, people who are saying that the Salvadorian guerrillas are communists, but they're not communists, they're just ordinary peasants, so why are we fighting them? The implication being that if they were communists, it would be okay to go in and pulverize them. And I pointed out that, well, look, at least in the FLMN, the front is at least two of those five groups, at least two, I don't, I'm not sure about all, in, but at least two of them would not deny the label communist. They would say, yo soy communista, you know, they'd say it and they would say it proudly. And what does it mean to be a communist? It means to fight and devote yourself to the people. If communists, if we leftists, if we Marxists, if we revolutionaries, if we progressives, if we if we want if all we want is hunger but for power, then why do we side with the powerless? Then why don't we toady up to power? Why don't we take the road of the Henry Kissingers and the Patrick da Patrick Daniel Moynihan's and the Zbigniew Brzezinski's and the Eugene V. Rostow's and the Mitch McGeorge Bundy's who toady up in the mouth of power? When Henry Kissinger was made National Security Advisor for Richard Nixon, Nelson Rockefeller gave him 50,000 bucks as a going-away president. As Nelson Rockefeller testified himself before the Senate Committee when he was being appointed Vice President of the United States, and they asked, and the Senators, well, they really went at Rockefeller really hard. They said, why did you do that, Mr. Rockefeller? And Rockefeller said, well, giving's always been a tradition in our family. Giving. They cast their bread upon the waters and more and more came back, didn't it? He wasn't saying to Henry Kissinger, Henry, I brought you out of Harvard. I brought you out of that offensive, or whatever that was, strategic studies, because I like the books you were writing, and you were writing them for me. Henry, you remember, you're going to go work for Tricky Dick, but you remember who you belong to. And that's what, that's what hunger power is. It's climbing like the political climbers and careerists have done in every country in the world. And we on the left don't do that. We stand out in the rain. We stand out on the picket line. We put our jobs on, on the line. We risk our careers. In many cases, we even risk our physical safety and our lives in all sorts of countries. If it's power we want, why do we take such circuitous routes? If it's power the communist wants, so why is he standing back there in 70 years, standing like a legion? Well, these communists do all these reform things, yes, and the liberal columnist Richard Cohen of the Washington Post says, and I, I think I've heard it about 800 times from different people, we ought to copy what the communists do. Why are we always on the wrong side? Why do we go into these countries and find ourselves on the side of big landowners and sweatshop owners? The, the big corrupt generals who run prostitution rackets on the side of all that stuff. Then why are we with that element? Why aren't we? Why don't we capture the hearts and the minds of the people the way the communists do? Why don't we copy their techniques? What are their techniques? Well, communist techniques are very well known. Just the thing, just the things we just said. They go into the village. They do land reform. They try to bring clean drinking water. They pay for the food they take. They try to help the people organize themselves. That's what they do. But if we did those things, we'd not only have our own, our stolen their program. We would have been become them because that's what they were doing. That's the thing we're fighting to prevent, not we. That's what our government and our ruling class is fighting to prevent. That's why we always go in on the wrong side, because
is the wrong side is the right side for the class interests of this administration and every other administration that's occupied the White House. So it is the heart of U.S. policy, ladies and gentlemen, to use fascism to preserve capitalism while claiming to be saving democracy from communism. Now, the Soviet Union is a serious problem for world capitalism. First, it's the strongest socialist country. As the strongest socialist country, it is a major target. Second, it has assisted other revolutionary movements, mostly just diplomatically, politically, morally, but also sometimes with material aid. Not much, but rather substantial aid in the case of Vietnam. So one goal is to try to contain the Soviet Union. The dream is finally to roll back the events of 1917, to undo history, to bring back that time when all the world belonged to us, and there were no problems like this, and there became an encirclement of the Soviet Union. The most targeted socialist country in the world today is not Nicaragua, nor even Libya. If you want to call Libya socialist, I wouldn't quite call it that. It's got an erratic leader. He does not immature things and says immature things, but he's also dangerous from a class interest. But I still wouldn't call him socialist. The most, the most encircled and threatened country is the USSR. It is the one that is targeted with all of these missiles. There is, ladies and gentlemen... Those missiles are not the result of an arms race. I maintain, they maintain that there is no arms race, and there never has been a race, as you know. The model of a race is the two proponents moving, each more furiously ahead of the other, trying to make as much, put as much space to get the ton of gold. That model doesn't explain arms escalation. What we have had, rather, has been an arms chase, with one side, the U.S., unilaterally escalating each time, other side, the Soviet Union, playing catch-up, often with a two- to seven-year lag in the particular weapons system. That was true of the A-bomb, the hydrogen bomb, the long-range bomber, submarine-launched missiles, the MIRVs, the multiple warheads, the ICBMs, tactical nuclear weapons, solid-fueled rockets, and now, even today, with the MX, the Cruise, the Pershing, and the Neutron bomb model doesn't explain it. It's a chase. As the Soviets said just several years ago, don't build a neutron bomb. If you build it, then we will have to build it. Don't build the MX if you do that. We will escalate on our ICBMs. That's hardly a race. That's more of a chase. The other side asking that this escalation not take place. And then when the escalation does, it reluctantly moves on and, and, and enters it also. Reluctantly, I say it because the arms race has had a tremendous damaging effect on the Soviet economy. Every time they have to build another tank, that's one less subway car for their subways. In the USSR, any city that reaches a million people gets a new subway built in it. Every new missile means that much less quality consumer goods. It's also, by the way, has the same drain on our country. But it, it's not as evident given the kind of country it is. There's an arms race here. The defense spending is, of course, an enormous shot in the arm to the owning class in terms of profits, guaranteed cost overruns, fat contracts, and so forth. The Soviet Union has a capital shortage, unlike the U.S., which has a capital surplus, and so, therefore, there's deprivation. The Soviet Union has a labor shortage, unlike the U.S., where there are 20 million underemployed. It has a smaller industrial base, so to match us, that's a greater dream on it. It has scientists who would prefer working on the civilian sector, because their work in the military sector remains anonymous. Managers who would have management jobs in the civilian sector. In short, it has a number of rational reasons why it would like to diminish the arms race. As Gorbachev has said again and again, we have a lot of building in our own country. We have never had a normal year in our history. We have had foreign invasion, revolution, invasion again, forced collectivization, etc., etc., armaments race, and we would like to have some normal years. Again, not necessarily love, but something much stronger, which is self-interest. So I would argue that Soviet escalations have been mostly reactive and defensive to U.S. escalations. 
This is true also if you look at the Soviet Navy. It has, until very recently, no aircraft carriers for attack and amphibian actions. It now has one. It's had a few mini carriers. The Soviet fleet is almost built almost entirely to tracking the U.S. fleet. See where it's going. Soviet interest in disarmament is reflected in the proposals that they have made. You could say, well, words are cheap. I want to see actions. First of all, words aren't cheap. Words count too. What a nation says is reflective of what it's doing, but actual moves have also been taken. For instance, one, the Soviets proposed the eventual disbanding of NATO and Warsaw Pact armies, a proposal, gradual, mutual de-escalation, step by step on each side, one, two, one to that, down like that. The U.S. turned down the proposal, would not even study it. The Soviets proposed a, in the last four years, nuclear-free Europe, reduced, reducing their minimum range SS 220s and all those that match the 162, which France and Great Britain had. That was a proposal made three years ago. That was a proposal which Gorbachev has brought forth again. It's one which Reagan has ignored simply to quote for zero sum and without the two step reason reasonable stipulations which Moscow has asked for, namely that if we get rid of all our missiles, both sides, we also guarantee that it, you don't have to transfer any of your existing missiles in Europe to the French or British, and the French and British begin to get rid of their missiles, or at least at this stage they freeze them. And in fact, the French and British now are increasing their number of intermediate range missiles. And I remember intermediate range missiles in the West, cruise and Pershing missiles in Western Europe are not intermediate range. They can reach Soviet soil, so they are strategic. They can hit Soviet ICBMs, Soviet SS-20s, are nasty weapons indeed, but they cannot reach the United States. They cannot knock out any MXs or ICBMs. They are not first strike potentials. Another thing to remember, cruise and Pershing missiles that are now in Europe have a seven minute strike time. That's the end of deterrence, and this is why Gorbachev and the Russians are beside themselves about the cruise and Pershing. This is why they walked out of Geneva in 1983, because Reagan refused to negotiate on the cruise and Pershing. This allows Reagan to turn around and say, we won, we went to Geneva, but they walked out, as he's going to do now with the latest cancellation. So what you do is you shove a person away, you act hostile toward them, you get up and they say, well, you obviously don't want to negotiate. They'll walk out, and then you turn to your people and you say, you see, they don't want to reach an agreement. If it takes me a half hour to get my missiles over and kill you, and you're a half hour to kill me, then in that half hour after I let mine go, you know they're coming and you let yours go at me. That's a deterrence to me. However, if I can reduce the striking time to seven minutes, and, and, you're, and they're so low and fast, and your radar can only pick them up in the last two minutes, I now have first strike capacity on you. You no longer have deterrence. I no longer can fear your missiles, because my missiles are targeting yours, and I'll knock out all your missiles, and then I'll have a second strike capacity to hit you. You'll have a feeble retaliatory strike. Your feeble retaliatory strike, however, will be blocked out by my Star Wars. Is that what Star Wars is all about? Yes, you see, criticisms about Star Wars are largely irrelevant in that area. People have said, scientists have said, it's a ridiculous project. It's going to have to work the first time and work perfectly. Only if the Soviets launched their 10,000 missiles at us in the fit of beef one day, they say, let's destroy the world, and they send the missiles at us. Only then will Star Wars have to work perfectly. But if the function of Star Wars is to be a shield against a feeble retaliatory strike of the Soviets after a first strike by the U.S., then Star Wars becomes much more effective. And Ronald Reagan himself let the cat out of the bag last year when he said, it doesn't have to work perfectly. And the speaks and all, they got, they got away him away from the platform and all that. Because they explained it to him just that morning at breakfast. And it is that if, 
I can only, if I can only block out 90% of 10,000 missiles, I'll be destroyed by a thousand missiles. But if of all the Ruskies have left are 60 or 70 missiles, and I can block out 90% of those missiles, then only 7 or 8 will hit us, and that is a called acceptable collateral damage. How do you like that? For 1984, 20 million, anywhere from the estimates of 4 to 20 million people, acceptable collateral damage. But we would have won one for the Gipper, eh? There are nuts in the Pentagon who think like this, ladies and gentlemen. They get big, fat military pensions, too. They get big, 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 fat salaries, and they've got big boards all lit up. They think like that all the time. But short of starting a nuclear war, the grand design is to have a first strike capacity. So that so puts the Soviets under the gun. Again, that will, will be back to 1947, when we could brandish that weapon around, and they would have to retreat. They would have to concede. They would have to pull back in fear back into 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Kennedy sat there and thought of a strike against the Soviet Union, and they realized that Khrushchev really had only one, possibly two, ICBMs that could reach the U.S., and it could only reach the northeastern corner of the U.S., but they realized, estimated, that this might cause a million, two million casualties, and that would be politically unacceptable, and so they discarded any idea of a nuclear strike against the Soviets. That one missile might have saved our lives, so it's not true that the missile might just build up blindly on both sides. They're caught in this irrational race. That is just something in, in man's nature for war. I love those songs, but there's something about the politics in one of them that didn't ring right with me. That it's just people caught up in this meanness and killing for a killing in the, and why? Why are we going to, when are we going to reach our senses? That's not true. That's not the way it works. It's not something that comes in here if it was something in our nature. Why would they have to draft us? Why would they have to use press gangs and, and drag us in? The Nazi leader Hermann Goring said, Nobody, no poor Slav, wants a war. Not even a German. Not even a German. Why does he want to sit in a stinking trench with the smell of blood and listening to the screams of his buddies lying there quivering with cold and terror? What he wants, where does he want to be? He wants to be in his home. He wants to be on his farm. He wants to be with his family. No poor Slav wants a war. You got to drag them out and dress them up and beat the drums and wave the flags. Within the last four years, the Soviets called for the banning of weapons in outer space before the United Nations, a resolution that was voted 124 to 1. Who was the one? Not the, not the U.S., Ronald Reagan. Wasn't the, it wasn't the American people, right? It was, it was the coterie that is misrepresenting us. All the opinion polls show that the American people didn't want weapons into outer space, at least back in those days before the Star Wars promo. 200 to 124 to 1 with one abstination. Do you know who the abstination was? It was Margaret Thatcher, who, as we all know, is Ronald Reagan in drag. The Soviets have signed a no first use pledge, a pledge that we will not be the first to ever use nuclear weapons, and the only reason they signed that is because they cannot imagine any time when it would be in their interest ever to be the fir first to use nuclear weapons. They haven't ruled out the possible use of them, and they keep building to that no first use pledge. The U.S. has refused to sign it. Well, so what? That means less hypocrisy, because when push comes to shove and the missiles are going to fly, they're going to fly, right? No. What nations say is an indication of their interests and their strategies to some degree. Sometimes there's lies and deception. The U.S. cannot sign a no first use pledge because no first use, because, because they have threatened every administration, has threatened the use of nuclear weapons. It's part of U.S. foreign policy. That's what Star Wars, that's what First Strike, that's what the Cruise and Pershing are, is to gain dominance again over the socialist countries, over the third world, by having nuclear superiority. The U.S. threatened first use and thought of using nuclear weapons at the Kazan during the Korean War. Eisenhower did. Nixon thought of using nuclear weapons at, what's the, what's the battle during the Tet Offensive? Was that 
Quezon. I'm getting my words mixed up. I mean in Quezon in Vietnam, and then and I, I forget what the other battle, the reservoir battle in Korea was. It was Eisenhower. The Eisenhower administration not only thought, deliberated using them, but actually decided at Tan Ben Phu and said yes, and offered nuclear weapons to the French and said, do you want to use some of these tactical nuclear weapons at Tan Ben Phu? And the French refused. They took the defeat instead. So, so they were ready, quite ready, to use them then. In any number of occasions, by the way, the use of nuclear weapons, the Kennedy administration, and the Cuban Missile Crisis seriously considered the use of nuclear weapons against the Soviet Union. As I mentioned before, so it's a part of policy. It is one of the weapons that to be used by to maintain imperial hegemony, to keep history from happening, to keep people under the gun. So if they signed a no first pledge, they could no longer threaten using the weapons. It would show them to be hypocrites and liars. They signed up, they signed the pledge, and here they are threatening to use the weapon. And if they, are, they signed the pledge and threatened to use the weapon, this would undercut the credibility of the of the use of the weapon. Or if they if they sign the no th first pledge, this would undercut the credibility of the threat of nuclear weapon and the value of those weapons as a threat. And by the way, it may not be that the U.S. is ready to destroy the USSR. Their ultimate plan is really to get such a superiority with Star Wars, Cruise, Pershing, and all that. A forward attack and submarines and everything else, that they will just be able to dictate terms, as I was saying. The first use pledge would certainly not fit into that scheme of things at all. Therefore, the policies are not really totally symmetrical between Moscow and Washington. The Soviet Union, this is one of the best kept secrets in the United States. The Supreme Soviet in February 1981, if you know, voted unanimously to endorse a mutual, bilateral, verifiable, nuclear freeze that was virtually identical to the ones which were passed in those 20 Vermont townships and voted in nine states and endorsed in hundreds of towns and cities in America, and its wording was almost word for word the same pledge. The Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union the same month voted unanimously to endorse a nuclear freeze. The U.S. has, in fact, ignored any proposal for nuclear freeze, despite a massive movement involving millions of people in this country. Probably the biggest mass movement in such a short time in our history was the nuclear freeze movement. I, you don't realize, you know, some of you are too young to realize what history you're making, you know. You don't realize, but, but it's incredible. It dwarfed in its numbers. It dwarfed the anti-war movement, at least for the first five years. It dwarfed the civil rights movement. It dwarfed the union movement and struggles in the 1930s, and the sheer number of people who signed up, who marched to demonstrate and wrote letters, who pledged for nuclear freeze. It was a mass movement, and the Reagan administration simply ignored the whole thing. It didn't exist, wouldn't hear of it, wouldn't consider it. It didn't fit into their very rational plan of a different kind of world. The Soviet Union has called for a re the reduction of ICBMs, Reagan administration refused to negotiate it or, or totally ignored that offer in 1982 and ignored it again when more dramatically Gorbachev came up and said, let's not negotiate it, but let me give you numbers. A 50% cut, both of us, right off the top. Let's start with a total on-site inspection. Another, by the way, another change in the Soviet policy. Total, complete on-site inspection under any condition you want. Come, come on in, look anywhere you want about this sort of thing again won't take a yes for an answer. Ronald Reagan won't. The Soviet Union had a unilateral and observed, and is still observing, unilateral moratorium on anti-satellite weapons testing. The Soviet Union called for, last year, cuts in conventional forces. Again, NATO and Warsaw. The Soviet Union unilaterally, unilaterally put a, observed a moratorium on, on, at, on, 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 on our ground at nuclear testing has called for a total ban on all nuclear testing because Gorbachev knows that if you stop nuclear testing, that's the end of the development of nuclear weapons. You can't develop nuclear weapons if you can't test anymore. And Reagan knows that also, and so he's ignored the proposal. 
The Soviets unilaterally last year, as you know, said we will not test for the rest of this year. And the Reagan administration said, oh, that's because they do all their testing early in the year and they've got them all done already, but we still have a few tests. Okay, okay, maybe that's it. So do all your tests, catch up, and when it comes December 31st, you say to them, we're going to observe it too. Didn't do that. January 1st came and Gorbachev said, we'll extend that moratorium several months and the U.S. said, oh, they extended it because they didn't test in the cold months, January, February, March. They don't test then, although they supposedly do all their testing in the early part of the year. I don't understand that one. And then when they, when they extend the moratorium yet a bit further, the argument was, this is a propaganda ploy. They're trying to appeal to the American people. And we, in order to reach the ultimate point of getting rid of nuclear weapons, will have to continue testing right now what was a masterful, a masterful faith of doublethink. I mean, that was an actual quote. I wish I had it. I, I couldn't find it in my materials on the plane. What I'm arguing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that U.S. foreign policy is not foolish. It's not stupid. It's quite rational. When someone says, what are we doing? We, we are opposing guerrillas in El Salvador. And we're supporting guerrillas in Nicaragua. That's quite rational. Because the guerrillas in El Salvador want to change the social order so-called guerrillas. They're not guerrillas. They don't live with the people and build their base in the country. The mercenaries and Contras who are, are attacking Nicaragua want to bring back the old order. That's a very rational system. They're not foolish. They're not confused. They know what they're doing. It is to defend the class order to make the world safer for hypocrisy. Star Wars. Besides being that defense, that, that, that first strike shield, people say it's too expensive. What are you talking about? It's too expensive. That's one of its attractions. It's going to cost a trillion dollars. It'll cost more than the entire New Deal, WPA program, and the Manhattan Project, which gave us the atomic bomb and the Eisenhower Highway Project. Put all them together in the building of all the railroads. Put all them together. They won't cost as much as Star Wars. A trillion is for the first stage. They think the first stage. That's what the boys like, who have these defense contracts. That's what they that's what they love. They see dollar bills. Getting there is all the fun. Whether it this the system works or doesn't work, the expensiveness is the major attraction. It will violate the ABM treaty, and now we we see even it violated the atmospheric testing treaty. What's wrong with that? Reagan has no loyalty to the ABM or atmospheric testing. He's been wanting to violate them since he's been in office. Now, having said all this and giving you this picture, I would like to add something else. That the ruling class rules, but it doesn't rule quite in the way it wants to. That, in fact, we must not be overwhelmed by these facts or this analysis, but we must be enlightened. We could understand why do they do these things. Ronald Reagan is not stupid. He gets it confused. He goes to, he goes to Ecuador and says, it's wonderful being here in Cambodia, you know, I mean, he, he does things like that, and he muffles on questions. Reagan, though, has been the most successful and rational, persistent president that I've ever seen in office in every single area, whether it's the NLRB, or busting unions, or cutting human services, or his people, environment he is, or, or, or defense spending, or foreign policy. He has advanced the appointment of reactionary judges. He has every single area, defunding the left, whatever. He has not looked left to stone and turned. He has advanced and pushed persistently. He has a cohesive goal and program. It is the goal of Cap Weinberger and Pat Buchanan. It is the goal of the radical right, and he has been successful at it, but not completely, because at the same time, in the years that Reagan has been in office, the protest has grown. Democratic forces have grown. Changes continue throughout the world. Peace forces in the Soviet Union, by the way, there are massive peace forces. Millions of people march, Leningrad Peace Committee. There are photos of people marching with these banners, no missiles, east or west. And again, you should make a distinction between a country which supports and encourages a massive peace movement, and in a government like ours which derides it, red baits it, ignores it, or puts it down. A nuclear freeze movement. Democratic forces have grown in power since Vietnam. Do you realize that Ronald Reagan has not invaded Nicaragua? I mean, do you realize, as I said before, that the United States has invaded Nicaragua 11 times? 
times and has actually occupied Nicaragua three times, including for periods of as much as 10 or 13 years. And the Marines went in there and burned huts and killed people and raped and murdered and dismembered people. Coleman McCarthy just had a column in the Washington Post of a 78-year-old guy who said, I was in there when we were fighting Sandino back in 1928 and when I got out as a young kid I had nightmares for years after I shot innocent people. We saw guys getting their genitals cut off and tortured. The Marines did that. Do you realize that? Do you realize today the United States has a striking power, a deployment power, a force, a delivery power that's a thousand times more powerful than anything Calvin Coolidge had? And you got a president that's a thousand times nuttier than Calvin Coolidge who would like to go in there, who, would, who wants to go in, who wants to go in, and yet he hasn't. But what has held him back? It's the democratic forces. It's the same thing that kept Nixon from using nuclear weapons in Vietnam. As it has the story come out when the Pentagon Papers were released, or not the Pentagon Papers, the White House tapes, where they were afraid of what this, this, this disruption and the reaction of the people in their own country. If the democratic forces in this country, if the democratic forces around the world, if the Nicaraguan and people who are armed and ready, you could go in and carpet bomb not lose a single man and just devastate it and destroy it but then you'll have to go in with troops like that lying in Antigone you know you would make of it a graveyard and call it peace but those troops would still find survivors and they would have to fight them and it would be unacceptable losses and Americans would die in Nicaragua and the war might escalate and all of the Latin American people might rise up why do you think those Latin Americans those corrupt, rich, compradore, collaborationist leaders say to Ronald Reagan, we don't want to in Nicaragua. We oppose that policy. We support the compradore program. And they suddenly going left on us. No, they're worried about the reaction of their own people. The losses in Nicaragua would be unacceptable, but unacceptable to whom? Not to Ronald Reagan. He wouldn't mind losing two, three, four thousand American boys if he can take Nicaragua. That's no loss to him. He's got plenty of fodder. He's got it right in this room. He'd have you down there. He'd have 261 Marines blown away in Lebanon in one day. And he'd wanted to go back in with more and fight more. Those were acceptable losses to him. That was no skin off his nose. It's his class interests he's worrying about. He keeps talking about the emergence of a Lebanese left and Lebanese socialism, and we must stop it. It was unacceptable losses politically. It, it means that there are political forces that can fight back. That's too costly to him, not morally. So we may be stronger than we think, and we must never believe that they try to make us believe about ourselves, that we're weak, that we don't have it, you see. Let me just close with one last little story, okay, because I've, I've been going too long. I, was, I lived in Washington. I was living in Washington about six years. I was asked by some Filipino exiles in 1981, I think it was or, or 82, to go speak at Lafayette Park at the White, the White House, right across the street in Lafayette Park. I always tell friends, I speak at the White House a lot, you know, the big megaphone when I, I speak at the White House. They said, do you speak at the White House? Yes, I speak at the White House. What? These microphones. And so, and so there I was speaking, you know, these Filipinos were so appreciative. It was so moving to me. Oh, Michael Parenti, would you speak? So I give the speech and I talk about the Philippines, what some of what I said to you. The Philippines are not a poor country, only the poor people are poor. It's rich, they should and they should deserve their own heritage, blah 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 blah. And I said this whole thing on and on. And here's this little band, about two hundred people, about half Filipino, half American. You know, I look at this and I look across at the White House, you know what I see? I see about six hundred police helmets with their guns, guns, rockets, fists, everything cars, all this stuff all over there, and I see limousines, a fleet of limousines come up, it's Marcos, President Marcos coming up to the White House porch, and you can't see the actual porch, it's blocked off, you can see the limousines go up there to get hugged and kissed by Ronnie Reagan, because he's a great defender of our democracy, this Marcos, and I see this, and I see all this display of power, and I see these Filipino heavies, the securities, they come around, they're looking, they're looking at the Filipinos, like checking them recognize anybody on it, and I'm standing there with our little, a brave little band of 200 people, with our signs, and we were walking around chanting, and I do what a lot of people do in this situation, I start to bleed inside, I start to say, my God, look at that power, look at that wealth, look at that force, and we've got this little band of people, you know, and after I gave my talk, I wandered over to, we had a fence up, and we had a display picture of Filipinos who had been tortured and found dead, grisly photos by the Marcos people, and, and, a, and a Marcos security guy, a Filipino thug, plain clothes, comes walking up, and he looks
smirks like a, you know, and I never had such a feeling. I wanted to really, you know, give him one upside his head, but I've outgrown those days. And I'm saying, look at this, they've got it all. What are they going to do? And look at what's happened three years later. And just look at what's happened. This incredible transition. Democratic force is mobilized. And this Marcos just blown away. Just remember who, who has the source of power. When the people get it together, they have a strength like nothing seen. The democratic forces move, the forces of reaction must retreat. And these great generals and dictators and presidents who sit there in their big palaces with their boodle and their corruption and their bayonets and their guns and their spies everywhere, they get thrown off just as stallions would throw off a little fly. So we speak truth to power, just remember that. Speak truth to power, mobilize, organize, never be sad. Remember what the great Italian communist Antonio Gramsci said. You have a pessimism of the mind, but an optimism of the will. You see the worst, you consider the worst, you work against it. But in here you work for what is freedom, for what is justice, for what is right. It is our destiny, it is our future. The future itself depends upon it. 